Welcome back. In this 11th video, we're going to look at setting up a dual camera system using Nina. Now, Nina has a specific plugin that allows you to synchronize between two instances of Nina running different cameras. And in the plugins, it's called the synchronization plugin. And what it does is it gives you two extra commands. One is a synchronized dither command, and the other is a synchronized wait. And what happens with both these commands is it's an opportunity for both instances of Nina to pause and wait for the other one to get to the same spot before both continuing. And it allows you to take images with both sets of cameras without them interfering with one another, or one changing the telescope position whilst the other one's trying to take a picture. And that's the key. What you want to do is have a master system, very much like a single camera system, and a secondary system that simply takes pictures when the tracking is good and at no other time. And before we start looking at how we do this in Nina, we need to think a little bit about the hardware and how it reacts with the software. So if I just shrink that down for a second and bring up this picture, this is the setup I'm currently using. And I have two refractors with um, filter wheels and cameras and off-axis guiders on both cameras. And although the cameras look very different and the focal lengths look very different, bizarrely they have exactly the same field of view and orientation. So the two images match up. You'll notice in the middle that there's a third refractor, and this is a guide scope. And we need to explain why we're using a guide scope and not using an off-axis guider. In a traditional one telescope setup with an off-axis guider, every time I would need to change the focus, I would disable the off-axis guider and do the focus and then start the guider again. Now each of these telescopes, their focus position may alter with temperature, but they might do it at different rates. So these two telescopes are operating independently doing autofocus runs. And so therefore I don't want one of these systems to be doing an autofocus run and disabling the guider whilst the other one is trying to take a picture. And similarly, if, for instance, the two systems are not quite at the same point and one's finished an exposure and the other one hasn't, I don't want this one being evaluated for, you know, drifting from the, the target and recentering and moving the telescope mount whilst the other is taking a picture. So again, back to this key principle, I want on the secondary system simply to take pictures when the tracking is good. Because one of the reasons you might say is, well, okay, don't stop the auto guider, but just let the auto guider run all the time on the off axis guider. But the problem with that is there isn't such a thing as a perfect focus mechanism. And as the focuser moves in and out, it also sometimes moves laterally, which then makes the guider think that the telescope has moved off the ideal tracking position and starts to correct it. Again, moving the tracking off the ideal and making the secondary system go wrong. What I do now is I use a refractor that's set up as a guide scope. So it's got a 360 millimeter focal length and very rigid with a guide at the back end. And that runs continuously. It never stops unless I'm recentering or slowing to a new target. With those things in mind, we need to think about how that affects the software in Nina. And I arrived at this configuration after a number of full starts. Obviously, if you're using reflectors as opposed to refractors, where you potentially have mirrors that move around, it may be less successful because the actual image position will change dynamically with the orientation of the telescope. And therefore, an independent guider may see differential flexure and provide a less than satisfactory result. OK, let's bring Nina back up and look at our equipment tab. This is the primary or master system, which controls all of the observatory and the guide and all those things. 
So if I look at the tab, I need to make sure that I've got the right camera connected to the right telescope. So this is a small chipped camera on a short focal length refractor, which is good. So I've locked that one in and it's filter wheel. And I can connect to all the other things in turn, which will quickly spin through. So as you can see here, I've got a filter wheel. Um, I've got the telescope connected, which is the mount. I've got the focuser connected for that particular refractor. I also have a safety monitor and the roof of the observatory and a weather monitor. And also in this case, I have the switch so I can turn power on and off if I need to. What I'm going to do is look at what the template would look like for this primary system. So I'm going to go into the sequencer tab and I'm just going to close all these, get them out of the way and pull up the templates. So what I have done is I've created templates for both the primary stroke master system and the secondary stroke slave system. So as before, I have a startup, which is basically the same as you've seen before. And I also have a wait for target, which I'll drag to there. And I now have an acquisition and I've got several different sorts, but I'm going to do um, narrowband and RGB. And I've labeled them so that I know that these are the observatory controller ones. So these are the main ones and I have a shutdown. So my naming um, comments at the end here, just remind me which one I'm looking at. I'm going to just take a quick look at these. They will look familiar if you've been looking at the other videos. So there's the usual wait, open the roof, wait for things to be cold. No change there. There's no change in terms of waiting for the system to get to the point of being ready to do some imaging. So the difference I'll show you in a moment between this and the secondary system is a secondary system does not need to operate the mount or the roof. There's the wait for target. And again, initially it looks perfectly normal. And as you expect, it is normal. It's exactly the same as we've had before. And it's monitoring the weather conditions and shutting the roof and parking the mount if it needs to. And the secondary system doesn't need to concern itself with these commands. Where it gets more interesting is when it gets to the actual physical acquisition. And if we go to the acquisition tab and open it up, so I haven't got a target in here at the moment because I've just pulled in a template, but if I scroll down to here, when it centers the target up, so when it's just about to start imaging and it wants to move the mount and center the target, we start seeing the introduction of the special synchronized weight instructions. And if you look, you can see there's one here and there's one here and there's one here. And I'll explain what that does in just a moment by putting it side by side with the secondary system so you can contrast and compare how they run in parallel. To do that, I need to bring up a second instance of Nina with a slightly different device setup and different templates. And the way to do that is if you right click the Nina icon at the bottom here, I can bring up my other system profile, which has got all the right um, devices set up in it. So the profiles for the, um, the, the system setups are also called master and slave. Again, so I can make the distinction. The camera, I'm going to connect through ASCOM, which seems to be a more reliable way of doing it. It defaults to the same cameras on the other system, so I need to switch it over to the larger chip and connect to it. And my filter wheel should just connect, and that's a slightly different filter wheel and I can connect to all the other pieces of equipment. So I've obviously got two focuses. Um, I'm using my old lakeside one on one system and the one built into the Pegasus unit on the other. Although I connect to the telescope mount, I don't actually ever uh, do anything with it other than monitor what it's doing. I do connect to a unique focuser. I do not connect to the guider. I can connect to the switch just so I know what's happening and the weather. Um, I can also connect to the roof so I know exactly what it's doing, but I don't physically touch it. Um, and I also connect to the safety monitor for reasons that we'll come on to in a little while. Because what you're trying to do is make both 
instances of Nina be in lockstep. So they need to react similarly. So that means they need to have the same target information, they need to have the same safety information, and so on, so that one doesn't do something that's unexpected from the other. I'm just going to rearrange my windows so that we can see the two systems side by side. Just before I do that, I'm going to go into the sequencer and load its own unique templates. So I have a unique startup and a unique shutdown, and these are labeled with CAM2 after it, so I can make the distinction. Wait for target and acquisition. And now I'm going to do the side by side by bringing these two together. And I'm going to put one on one side and one on the other so we can see them. And the reason we're going to do this is we can line them up and see how they compare with the instructions. So I don't need this bit anymore. I can shrink that down because it's not needed anymore. And I'm going to also, I found this little button here that shrinks the menu down that gives you a little bit more space. So I'm going to expand out the start and then scroll up on the top of here and look at the start on this one as well. The difference between them is this one has to open the roof and do all the fancy things with monitoring the weather. All this does is it waits until sunset, which is exactly the same as this one, and it waits until safe and then cools the camera. So it doesn't do any of the roof control or the mount control. That's pretty straightforward. And again, this cool period is very similar to this one. The only difference being that this doesn't have to cope with shutting the roof if the conditions change. So it simply just waits until nautical dusk. And this one does the same. In fact, that's a very important point. This loop until nautical dusk needs to be identical on both sides so that both camera systems are reacting to the same conditions. So I'm going to shrink that down for a second. The wait for target. Let's bring those up. The wait for target on the master system has to cope with the weather conditions and it opens and closes the shutter if necessary. All this does is simply waits for the target to be above the horizon, which is the same as the outer loop of this one. So again, the conditions for this loop coming out of itself is identical between the two systems. And importantly, when we start to do physical imaging, we must load the same target information into both systems so that they react to the conditions being the same. I haven't tried this with a mosaic by trying to do side-by-side -side images, um, but you probably need to think a little bit about how you'd manage that. So I'm going to shrink that down a second, the wait for target, and then we're going to look in more detail at the acquisition, which is where all the fun starts. So I'm just going to pause that for a second, rearrange the boxes so that it's clear, and then come back. At this point, both cameras are chilled, and the scope is parked, and the roof is usually open if the weather conditions are good. And on the master system, just as you would do normally, you open the shutter, unpark the scope, slew to the coordinates, and then you would normally run autofocus, and then slew and center and fine tune. But whilst it's doing that, while you need to do the autofocus on both systems, you don't want it to be running the autofocus whilst it's slewing or centering. So you'll notice here there is a synchronized weight just here. And this is a cue. And you find the same cue is here. So at this point, the process stops and waits for this one to get to the same point. And then both systems run their autofocus at the same time, now that it's pointing at the target and it's tracking. There's a second synchronized wait just afterwards because the autofocus routines don't necessarily run quite at the same speed and they both need to stop before you get on to the next bit, which is the slew and center. So there's a synchronized wait either side of the autofocus to make sure that the autofocus 
is completed on both systems before it goes on to the next step, which is to do the slew and center. And then if I scroll down a little bit further on this, once it's done the slew and center, it starts the guiding on the master system, and then there's this last synchronized weight, which matches with this one. We've now got a system that's tracking perfectly. It's all focused up on both systems, and now you need to kick off the secondary system to start actually taking some pictures. So now we need to look at the next little bit, which is the physical taking of pictures and the dithering between the two systems. So I'm going to collapse these two and look at the acquisition cycle itself. And I'm going to scroll up so that we can see what it's doing. We have two systems doing narrowband acquisition and one controls the dither and the other one doesn't. And you will immediately see that there's a synchronized dither command in both systems and they're doing it after six exposures. And the general principle here is that I take two hydrogen alpha, two sulfur, two oxygen, and then do a dither and then I repeat. But what I don't want to happen is the dither command from the master system interfering with any of these exposures. So again, this synchronized dither, which comes from the plugin, pauses the systems until they both arrive at this point and then they can continue. If I think about the master system, it'll take a bunch of exposures. It'll get to the point of doing six exposures and do a dither command. But before it does the dither command, it'll wait for this one to get to the same point. And then once it's done that, both systems will sit there. This one will do a dither on the master. And then once it's done, it'll start taking another round of pictures. And just to be sure that it does not take pictures before the system has settled, I have an additional synchronized wait just before I switch the filter for the first exposure on both sides. This guarantees that the two systems are in lockstep for the first exposure after the dither. If I scroll down further, you'll see I'm also using the moon angle idea that I showed you in the previous video. But the important thing here is to make sure that the conditions for both are identical in both systems. And this also applies to the target. So for instance, you don't want this going off and doing a different set of exposures because it thinks the moon angle is different to this system. And again, it's a case of balancing the two. And the other thing about the balance is to try and keep the exposure times roughly the same. So I've got 300 second exposures for each of my narrowband filters in both system. So they should stay in lockstep and there shouldn't be too much hanging around and inefficiency on the secondary system waiting for the primary one to finish. And similarly, if I just shrink that down and look at my RGB filters, I do exactly the same thing. I've got my synchronized dither for six exposures. I have my synchronized weight put into the system just before the first filter goes um, changes for the exposure. And I've got a slightly different moon angle in this case. Um, they are the same. If I stretch that, you'll see it's 120 degrees. So again, the conditions for taking pictures are identical. And in terms of the target information, I would populate the target here with exactly the same target information on both systems again, so that all those calculations for when to stop taking pictures, when to start taking pictures and the moon angle are identical in both cases. So I scrolled back up to the top and you can see both in the secondary system and in the primary system that I've got loop until time astronomical dawn and also loop while altitude above horizon and they would be identical on both secondary and primary systems again so that it wouldn't start trying to expect to take pictures on one side and be giving up on the other. When it comes to the shutdown it's much easier to compare them and if I just scroll down on both cases on the one hand I have to disconnect all the equipment after closing the shutter and parking the scope, warming the camera 
and then I turn the outputs off. I have a synchronized wait in here before turning the output powers off because on the other side I just need to warm the camera, disconnect the equipment and then wait to synchronize with here and then the physical power switches get switched off in the Pegasus unit and then I can disconnect the switch. To make the most of any single night you might want to consider taking multiple targets and I'm going to just pull in an example that I'm using at the moment of multiple targets. So in my sequences I have the same name for the target but put the word slave on the secondary system and on this one I don't. And if I just collapse that down for a second, you can see here's the startup, the wait for target, the target name, another wait for target, the next target name, and you can repeat these. And these are now populated with target information. And you can see that all this information about astronomical dawn and the loop whilst altitude above horizon is now populated properly because it has target information on both cases and it's identical in each case. And that's the trick. So to set this going, what I typically do is I start the primary system off first and then a few seconds later I start the secondary system. And once the secondary system starts, they detect each other and the synchronization process starts looking out for each other. And at the end of it, I just simply shut down and save the sequences if I need to. We are almost at an end, but there's a couple of other things to mention. I'm using a dual camera system with a primary and a secondary, but there's no reason why you can have multiple secondary systems, all with the same information, all doing their own thing with their own camera. The other thing to mention is the plugin itself has a setting. So the synchronization plugin has a timeout period. So it hangs around for that period and after which it decides to do its own thing. I think the default is 300 seconds, but I've increased it to 10 minutes just to be on the safe side. On this one, you can also see that the exposure information has been populated as this sequence has been running for several nights. And this is a result of using a different plugin called Oboculum. And not only does it give you a set of loop conditions which allow you to do intelligent starting and stopping of sequences, but it also can do various other things like balance the exposures between the filters in case you have too many reds compared to say green and blue. I don't use it in that sense for dual camera systems simply because I want the two to be in lockstep with each other and doing the same thing. And I don't really want to start changing the way the exposures work on one system because probably what will happen is it will hang around for longer waiting for the other one to catch up. So hopefully that's been useful and uh, thank you for watching.